And um, they wanted to prove this, this convention of blonde mothers wanted to prove to the world that blondes aren't dumb. So they had this big conference, big convention. They all gathered together in a roaring crowd of some 40,000 people, 40,000 blondes all in one room. Can you imagine? They gathered together and they're cheering, blonde power, blonde power, blonde power, and blondes aren't dumb, blondes aren't dumb. So they wanted to prove it. So the announcer gets up there and she says, we're going to prove it. Let's pick somebody. So they pick somebody from the front row and they come up here and they say, I tell you what, we're going to prove once and for all to the world. We're going to show them that blondes aren't dumb. Tell me, what is 30, what's 15 plus 15? And she thinks long and hard. She thinks and the crowd's going, do it, do it, do it. She says, 37. Oh, the crowd's disappointed. They all, oh, they moan, they groan. How awful and terrible that it is. That she guessed the wrong number, and they say, but then they start to chant, "Give her another try! Give her another try! Give her another try!" The whole crowd, the mass, so they give her another. Okay, we're going to give her another try. What is eight plus eight? She thinks really hard. She thinks really hard. She says nineteen. Oh, the crowd's disappointed. Oh, they were just so upset. Oh, no, this is terrible. This is terrible. Uh, give her another try. They begin to chant again. Give her another try. Give her another try. So the announcer says, okay, we're going to prove once and for all to the world that blondes aren't dumb. What's two plus two? She thinks really hard and long. She says, four. The crowd begins to chant again. Give her another try. Give her another try. <laughs> well... Happy Mother's Day. Every Mother's Day sermon I've run across, I want to begin with an explanation because there's one exception for Mother's Day, and Mother's Day has different meanings for, for people. And for some, motherhood is an accident, maybe. Maybe it was an unwanted uh, thing, maybe not always welcome. For some, Mother's Day is biologically impossible, so you were unable to have children, and this is a difficult day for you. One of the worst days of the year. You don't want to come to church on this day because it's about mothers and you feel, you know, um, it's a lot of feelings, I imagine. Uh, some that I can't fully appreciate because I'm not you. For some, your mom wasn't very nice. And so Mother's Day is difficult because your memory of your mother might not be something that was very pleasant. Um, for some... Motherhood, under the very best of circumstances, is still less than a bed of roses and, you know, sort of a primrose path, and so it's not that happy of a thought. For those of you who are here that have not been able to be mothers biologically or, or even really been able much in life to mentor a younger person as a mother, as a mother role figure, I want to bring you this solace and comfort today that the Lord Jesus knows how you feel. Um, in the respect that in this world his life was taken from him before he was a father, before he had a chance to be in the role of leadership over others. However, we see him as, you know, God the Father giving his only son, but still, count yourself to be associated with Jesus, whose life was taken from him in such a way that he was not able to be in that sort of role either. So I just want to comfort you with that. But being a, a mother biologically in, in this world... Um, maybe not so difficult in some ways, but being a mom is, is difficult. And like the video showed, kind of give us a chuckle there, but um, very much so. And with all these qualifications um, that I just laid out, why bother with Mother's Day at all? Well, because Mother's Day is important. I'll tell you why. Because for all of its stumbling blocks, for all of its pitfalls, all of its broken dreams, all the soiled diapers, soiled wallpaper, soiled plans, we're talking about a beautiful idea, a natural part of God's creative plan to bring love and caring to light and to bring it into the world. And motherhood is a constant demand for the gift of loving and caring. And I want to point out a few things here today. Number one, that moms carry heavy burdens, enormous burdens. And moms, because moms are people, they suffer pain because of sin. And the physical pain in childbirth is number one, because of sin, God told Adam and Eve, that Eve would suffer pain in childbirth. In fact, the very first time the word pain is mentioned in Scripture is in association with Eve as directed at her for the pain of childbirth. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 says to the woman, he says, I will in 
greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pains you will give birth to children. Your desire, the second part of the curse, your desire will be for your husband. I don't know how you want to take that. And he will rule over you. That's the third curse, right? <laughs> for all the women here. But, but the pain in childbirth is definitely one of them. And that because of the world that we live in, because of sin, that is pain. And number two, another thing, another burden that a mom carries, moms carry the burden of temptation and blame. Now, the reason I say this before you go running off with this thought, let me point out a couple things. One is Eve was given tem to temptation, and most of us are very familiar with the Genesis account of, of the fall of man when sin entered the world, and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, and then she shared it with Adam, who also sinned too, knowing where she got it from. So it's just as much his fault as it is hers. And it seems that Adam was not that different from today's man, because it says in Genesis 3.12, when God asked him what happened, he says, the woman you gave me, she did this. He blamed her right away. Now, I know that never happens in real life. Um, <laughs> the woman you gave me, she, she's to blame. He laid all the blame on his wife, ignoring his responsibility in the matter. He made her his scapegoat. So she suffered because of that. She carried the burden of his blame. She carried the burden of that sin, knowing what had been done. So today, moms, in a similar way, carry that same burden. The third thing is moms suffer greatly when their children are hurt or they fail. In Genesis chapter 4, we find that, yeah, that Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and that like any good mother, she loved both her children. Imagine how she felt when she learned the tragedy that Cain had murdered Abel out of jealousy. It must have torn her heart apart. It must have broken her. I can't imagine how I would feel if that similar thing were to happen in my life. She surely must have understood that because she disobeyed God and because of sin, that she ultimately was responsible for what has happened and what had caused her son to murder her brother, even though not directly responsible, she felt the burden of that when her children failed and when they hurt. How many moms understand that? Moms carry that heavy burden. When your children are hurt or when they fail, uh, the, the, you suffer the same thing that Eve suffered. You feel the same pains in your life. So moms carry heavy emotional burdens for their kids, and some moms reject this responsibility and, and allow the world to raise their kids and uh, with all of its impu uh, impulses and all of its values in life early, and that early childhood development is meant for a mother. You've heard me say this in the past, but a mom's voice is at a pitch where babies hear it better, and, and, and uh, you know they, they talk, they're more talkative at a younger age with the children than than men are, and it's true that women speak an average of 30,000, some 30,000 words a day, men speak 5,000 words a day, and there's a reason for that, and it's not just because uh, we can make jokes about it all day. Uh, see, I told you there was a reason you talk more than I do. Uh, it's not for that. It's because God had a plan for communication. That early childhood development, especially with a mother, is so vital and so important, uh, and, and it's so uh, significant. The lesson is clear that mothers should believe God and and obey his instruction to us. John says in 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. In other words, God has an idea for us in his word. He has a plan for us in his word. He didn't just give us his word by accident and, and hope that it turned out. My mom's word meant a lot. It means a lot today. I ask her for her advice today. I ask her what she thinks about stuff today. I ask her to pray for things for me today. She is someone that I trust in because when I was a young man and when I was a younger kid, she was the one that kept me in line. Uh, my dad did too. He was the enforcer, but mom was the one who loved me, who got me out of bed and drug me to the schoolhouse, pounding on the door to get the janitor's attention, to get my homework out of the locker after hours to make me do it, no matter what time or night of that time of the night that it was. She was determined. But she was also there at the basketball game, screaming and yelling like a crazy woman in the stands as I would, you know, do my thing out there. I'd say, who's that woman? Uh, that's, I don't know who she is, you know. I, she's just some crazy lady up there. I don't know who she is. Um, but that was my mom. So moms are tough, and, and moms have all of this, and, and there's a lot on there. If a mother really loves her children, the first and, and best thing that we can do for them as moms, or you can do for them as moms, is to be godly, to be a Bible-believing mother. This is something that is very absent in our culture, in our generation today, Bible-believing mothers. If a mother believes and follows uh, God, she can be a good influence with her children. God says that of the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. You knew I was going there somewhere today, didn't you? 
The Bible says, her children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband also, he praises her. And that is the, an attitude that children should have toward their mothers, that they bless them, and they are blessed by them, and they return that praise to their moms. Moms also suffer. Moms have suffered abuse and abandonment. And the first thing I want to point out here, our responsibility to mom is huge. We are to, uh, oh, I'm going too fast, aren't I? Uh, we suffer more abuse from those that are closest to us than anyone else. Um, Genesis 16 describes how Abraham, the father of the Jews, had a wife. His name was Sarah. Remember the story of Abraham and Sarah, who was barren. She was past childbearing years, some 90 years old, and, or uh, getting close to 90 at this point. And she mistakenly wanted to help God fulfill his plan. And so she got her maidservant and, and she um, fu- uh, gave him her, her Egyptian servant girl, Hagar, and a con- as a concubine to to um, Abraham for him to have children by her to give him babies and so that she might bear a son. So Hagar did have a son, called him Ishmael, as you know. And he became the father of the Arab nations, as we know him today. And that in chapter 21, describes how the afterward of Genesis chapter 21, God miraculously gives Sarah a son and named him Isaac. So now, after Sarah's 90 years old, she has a son and, and names him Isaac, but She's already tried to intervene in God's plan by putting Hagar out there for Abraham. And, and so Abraham had a son by Hagar called Ishmael. And so all of a sudden, um, she didn't want Hagar and Ishmael hanging around anymore. Sarah, the Bible says she became abusive toward Hagar. And, and Abraham sent them away. Could you imagine what abuse that that would have been? What a horrible situation. You know, in America today, one in every four women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. An estimated 1.3 million women are victims of physical assault by an intimate partner each year. Of those abused in intimate relationships, 78% were unmarried. 85% of domestic violence victims are women. 85%. Historically, women have been the most often victimized by someone that they knew. Women, are tw- women who are 20 to fo- 24 years old are the greatest risks of non-fatal intimate partner violence, meaning boyfriends or, or even spouses, husbands. Most cases of domestic violence are never reported to the police. Witness, um, witnessing violence between one's parents or caretakers is the strongest risk factor of transmitting violent behavior from one generation to the next. Because what they see in one generation, they will do in the next. You've heard, this, you've heard the saying, well, one generation allows in moderation, the next will allow in excess. And that's exactly what happens with violence. Boys who witness domestic violence are twice as likely to abuse their own partners and children when they become adults. 30 to 60% of perpetrators of intimate partner violence also abuse children in the household. Almost one-third of female homicide victims that are reported to police re- uh, police records are killed by an intimate partner or boyfriend. And 70 to 80 percent of intimate ho- partner ho- homicides, no matter which partner was killed, the man physically abused the woman before the murder. Intimate partner violence results in more than 18.5 million mental health care visits each year. That is powerful stuff. What does it say? He's saying that abuse is not only common in our generation, but it's been common for many towards women. It's something that we should put a stop to. And I don't think a transgender bathroom is going to help. Our responsibility to our moms are huge. Number one, we're called to protect them. In fact, Scripture says in Colossians 3.19 about husbands, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In In another place, Scripture says, Husbands, if you abuse your wives, if you're harsh with them, God will not hear your prayers. Wow. Husbands abusing his position and physical power is not a godly man. Sons and daughters, no matter their age, have a role in keeping their moms close and and respecting their convictions. We We have a privilege and a responsibility as a culture, as a generation, to begin something that's been lost, and that is the art of protecting our mothers. Number two... Our responsibility to our mom is huge. We're also to behave with wisdom and maturity. I know nobody likes this one. Proverbs 10, 1, the scripture says, A foolish son is grief to his mother, 
You've heard me say before, growing older is automatic. Growing up is a choice. We can grow older all the time but never grow up. Now God's called us to grow up and to mature and to be mature because that brings respect to our mother and our father. But specifically, it shows the grace and the goodness that our mom has showed us in our life to grow up with decency and maturity. Another thing we have a responsibility to do to our moms, number three, is to treat them with greater respect as they get older. Proverbs chapter 23, 22, Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. If you stood by the bedside of your dying mom, as, as, as some have, and you, you've had to make that difficult decision maybe about her death and about what was going to have, to have to happen in those moments, whether or not to pull the plug. I've been at the bedside of a person uh, whose the son or daughter, or son, daughter and son-in-law were, were by her bedside, and they had to make that difficult decision, and it was hard. And it was only a matter of hours later that she went to be with the Lord. She finally gave up this fight on this earth. And i got to tell you, if you've ever been that, in that position, you have the greatest respect and, and grace from me. I have seen it up hand close. And when they get older, we're supposed to treat them with respect. You know, in a generation that does not understand this, there's this game out there. It's, it's horrible. It's called the knockout game. How many have seen this on television or the news? Young people in these gangs are going up, and they're finding older people, and they run up to them, and they punch them in the face to knock them down just because they're older. It's a fun game in the subways. They, have, they record it on video and put it on YouTube. Apparently, it's a cool thing to do. I tell you what, if I could get a hold of one of those guys that did that, <laughs> God help me. If you stood in those positions where you have been tempted to berate your mother or, or not show respect, I, I urge you today, Show them even greater respect as they get older. I know when you see them get older, sometimes certain things become missing, certain things happen if, if they begin to lose their faculties. and um, That can be a challenge. Unlike Emily, uh, Emily, was she was sharp as a tack right up to the end. Amen? Amen. And, and we all loved her. We miss her as part of our church family. She was really a mom to all of us. But uh, 90, day before she turned 95, I think, is when she went to be with Jesus. And uh, sharp as a tack. Proverbs 31, verse 8, Scripture says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. I remind of Pete sitting here. He has a valuable ministry in what you do in that, that Lutheran uh, retirement nursing home. And those are important things that, that all of us have the privilege of doing. We all have the privilege of speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves. As our parents get older, as our moms get older, they deserve even more and more respect. Right, kids? Yes. yes. All right, two or three of you, praise God. Another thing we can do for our moms that we should do is, number four, give them something to smile about. Laugh because you're funny. Some of the best times we've ever had have been maybe in the car when, when uh, somebody says something so crazy. We were sitting in the car one day and just caught us just right, and we're talking about the spleen. I have no idea why we were on the topic. We were talking about the spleen. And so Jesse, in his inquisitive manner, says, What's a spleen do? And one of the other boys, I think, says, well, it spleens. <laughs> we almost had to pull the car over because we were laughing so hard. It just caught us just right. Make your mom laugh. Make her smile because they're so proud and amazed at what you can do. Proverbs 23, 25 says, May your father and mother be glad. May, he who, may she who gave you birth, re, not he, may she who gave you birth rejoice. Amen? If your, mom, if your mom can smile at all, it should be because of you. Because not only is she proud of you and loves you, but because you purposely do what you can to make her smile. What else can we do for our moms? Number five, keep them as close as possible. Proverbs 19, 26 gives us this word. He who robs his father and drives out his mother as a son who brings shame and disgrace. I have been in this position, and I have seen this, where people 
when their mom gets older or that times get difficult, they put them out or put them somewhere else. And sometimes that's the way that it has to be. We can't manage them on our own. But friends, I want to encourage you as much as possible, keep them as close as possible. Even if they're in a home somewhere, if they're older or, or, or that maybe you've, you've crossed a boundary somewhere in your guys' lives with one another and your relationship is scarred, make sure to reach out and, and to do your part to heal that relationship. Swallow your pride, amen? And go to that person, ask for their forgiveness, and, and be that son or daughter you know that you can be. Hagar left the camp. The rest of the story is she left the camp with her son and traveled through the middle of the burning desert south of Beersheba in the wilderness of Judea. She was trying to get back to Egypt, but she wasn't going to make it. Most of all, she was very concerned about her son Ishmael. And she, the bread was gone, the water was gone, she didn't have anything left, and here she is, out in the middle of the desert. Most of all, she was uh, uh, there by herself. And so she takes her son and she puts him under a plant out there for a little shade and she walks far enough away to where she can't hear him scream and cry just to wait for him to die because it broke her heart so much. All of this was gone. She didn't have anywhere to go. She sat down at a distance and she waited for him just to die. Then in Genesis 21, 17, Scripture says... God heard the voice of the lad and sent an angel to reassure her of his great promise. Then he provided a well of water. Friends, i got to tell you, moms, when you feel dried up and alone, you don't know if there's any hope, God provides a well. He makes a way. Those of you who are in this place or watching the video, if you're a single mom, i got to tell you today, and I've walked with some of you through some of these dark times, I can't fully appreciate your situation, I'm not you, but I know because of God's word and his promise that he provides a well of water. He will take you to the place sometimes where you feel like you have nothing left, the bread is gone, the money's gone, the water's gone, nothing is there, the friends are gone, everybody has left you, but, but still, God will provide a way. In a generation that is largely fatherless, he will be a father to those who are without a father, so be assured of his promise today that he will make a well when there seems to be nothing left. God has his promise of his word. Many, mo many mothers for different causes find themselves in desperate situations and it, it may be maybe our fault. We know that repercussions of sin come around but the truth is that God is still merciful and he's still caring no matter what we've done and he is a healing God. It may or, or may not be uh, in the center of your wheelhouse to understand that right now but I got to tell you, if you ever come across that situation in life, trust him. He has a well in the middle of the desert. Don't give up. Don't abandon him. Look, there's a well. There's food. He has a way out for you. So with all of these things, to keep our moms close, to make them laugh, to be a part of their life is so important. Um, uh, something to look at with Hagar's situation. She was abandoned. But abandonment is opportunity for God's adoption. He is the one to give the abandoned mom strength. He is the one who will guard her heart and meet her needs. Hebrews 13, 5, For the Lord himself said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Godly moms do some things too. I want to point out just a couple, three things here. The first thing is, godly moms protect their children. In Exodus chapter 2, it describes Jochebed. And Jochebed had a child. His name was, of course, Moses. And she had a tremendous problem because of the law of the land. The Hebrews were growing too numerous, uh, according to the Egyptians. So what the Pharaoh did, he put out a decree that all of the baby boys were to be drowned in the Nile. Now, this is a horrible thing by a cruel and oppressive government. Could you imagine? The Bible talks about this prophetically. There were cries coming out from that place of women who had lost their newborn babies to this horrible thing. It's not unlike our mo modern godless government and society and our education system that teaches that children are simply biological accidents. I mean, no special creation for God. I remember being at Fred Meyer years ago, and I, was, I had a card, and I had... You know, two of the boys in front, they have the double carts, or they had them. I don't know if they still do. I had one hanging on the end of the cart. I, I See, I had a one in the backpack, so I had all four of them. I ran to the store for Pam to give her a break, and I've got all four of the kids at Fred Meyer, and I'm standing in line. 
And you can imagine the chaos. Brandon bouncing up and down in the end of the cart. Justin and Jesse here. And then, and then I've got uh, or Jesse right here. And I've got uh, Justin and Andrew in the cart. And it was a chaotic mess, you know. Uh, when we go to the store, they learn to stand in the squares. Um, you can stand in the square. I don't care how much you wiggle. I don't care how much you dance. But you can stand in this square. Do not leave this square until I tell you to. If you leave this square, you're busted. Get to the checkout line with my 40 boxes of cereal, my 20 packages of diapers and formula mix. And, and I'll never forget, because it was this horrible thing, and this, this person, this woman was staying there, and she had a couple items. She was behind me. So, ah. She kept going like this. Ah. And I'm just like, you know how it is. It's kind of like, do you want to go in line? Well, I already have my stuff on the thing. And, and she goes, ah, ah. sir, you have four kids. She said this to me. I said, yeah, yeah, four kids. Proud, right? And she goes, kind of like this, turn away. And that was irresponsible. I heard what she said, but she turned away just enough for me to hear that. Kids are such an inconvenience in our world. We got to the end of the line, and and we got outside, and I think it was Andrew that spoke up and said, Daddy, how come people hate kids so much? I'll never forget that statement. It, was, it tore my heart out in those moments. But the idea that the children are an inconvenience in our culture is very much the truth. I remember when we uh, were having Jesse, and life was you know, kind of chaotic and hectic. At one point, we had three in diapers. We changed diapers for eight years in a row. Um, we know what that's all about. I'm sure some of the others of you have been down that road as well. Um, and I just got good at changing diapers. The, 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 when it comes out the mouth, I have a harder time with that. But for some reason, when it comes out the back, I had an easier time. I could handle that part. I don't know why. God gave grace, grace toward me. But I'll never forget their um, being all small and growing up and having the privilege of, of seeing that and being a part of their lives. Life is hectic. It was tough. When I find this situation with Jochebed being so inconvenient, she does something to protect her child. She takes Moses and she makes a, a basket and pit, puts tar and pitch on so that it floats in the river. And the scripture says she puts Moses into this basket and she has um, her her daughter watch Miriam watching over the basket and, and puts in, sends Miriam to watch from afar off. She protected her children. Moms, it's important that we protect our kids. And as they get older, as they get to be teenagers, it's even more imperative that we allow their electronic devices not to be alone with them in their rooms, perhaps. As they get older, it's more imperative that we watch what they're watching and listen to what they're listening to, that we're more cautious about the things that we allow to come before their eyes as they get older. Lots of things begin to change. Lots of desires and wants. Who is this kid that woke up this morning? I thought you were the child that I bore. I don't recognize you. You're an ugly thing. Go back to bed. Sometimes it's like that, isn't it? And moms, it's important that we protect our kids. We protect them from a culture and generation of psychobabble that's being taught in our schools as well. That's very important that we guard the hearts and minds of our kids where they're being taught evolutionary principles all day. We have to be the ones to safeguard their hearts and tell them the truth about God's love and his creation and all that he has in store for them. We need to protect the hearts of kids. By the time a child is 10 years old, his core values for life are established. 85% of people that come to Christ do so before they're 18 years old. And there's a reason for that, because moms have the opportunity to shape the heart of their children. The second thing godly moms do is to influence their children to follow Jesus. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe, and she saw this little basket floating near the reeds. And she had one of her maids go and bring the child to her and crying. And Moses' real mom was hired to nurse him. She, she caught Miriam and she said, hey, go get one of the, the ladies, to, uh, the Israelite women who's nursing, to come and nurse this baby. And his very mom was the one that was chosen and brought into the palace to be able to nurse and to care for this child. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's palace. He knew the luxury and the splendor of the greatest empire of the ancient world. And his, but his real mom, uh, his real mother, he, he learned from. 
He learned about his true identity, and he learned about the people of God and their plight and bondage in Egypt. And when he became old enough, Moses left all that wealth and power and, he, and the ease of Egypt and returned to the oppressed people of God to, to help them, to bring them out of that bondage. And, and you can't explain Moses' actions or understand contributions of his life apart from the story of his mother, Jochebed, because she literally saved his life. She protected him. She guarded his heart against the false religious ideologies of, of that culture, of that generation, of that day. She protected him from the teachings of the Temple of Ra, and she brought him into the light of Jehovah, the only one true God, and she taught him about his ways and his truth. Godly moms protect their children. We don't let them do weed with the other kids. We make sure that we know where they're at. We make sure that we know what's going on with them, and we keep them in church. We keep them in church. You see these young people sitting on the front row. Maybe not some of them by choice, but they're in church. They're sitting on the front row. I got to tell you, when I see them lead worship on Wednesday nights, they're not only talented, but they love to worship. And they love Jesus. And I'm so proud of them for that. A good friend of uh, Abraham Lincoln was writing, and he wrote about the influence of a mother. And it goes like this. A good friend of mine who was raised by a godly pastor's wife tells me that when he was rocked to sleep at night by his mother, she didn't sing to him just little ditties of lullabies. She sang to him hymns of faith. When he was in the crib, he remembers her leaning over and singing to him, A mighty fortress is our God, and can it be? She sang songs like, More love to thee, O Christ, my Jesus, I love thee. Come thou, fount of blessing. She sang in the deep songs, and he says, I remember, I remember those hymns. In fact, he says, when I got to church, I had, learned, uh, I had heard and learned most of the hymns, a contribution in that young man's life that he will have never forgotten. No one is poor, he writes, who had a godly mother. Friends, the call to be godly is not just for men, which we desperately need in our generation. The call to be godly is for moms to love Jesus with all of your heart, and to know his word, and to instruct your children early to follow the Lord. A godly mother finally is faithful. Remember Mary, when she was told by the angel of this amazing message, that the Holy Spirit would come on her, and she would conceive in her the Messiah, that she would birth the God prophesied to mankind. When she heard the message, she obediently let it said, let it be done as you have said. This young girl who was perhaps 14 years of age, 15 possibly, that was told this amazing thing, says, just let it be as you say. Whatever it is that you want, Lord. So God wanted a godly mother and to bring the Lord Jesus into the world. So Mary, because of her faith, because of her fruitfulness, was able to be that mother. She was asked to make a great sacrifice, but she believed and she trusted God. Rather than looking at the world and what they would look at from the outside and, and her feeling ostracized and condemned, she counted it rather to be accepted by God, that she trusted him for what was going on inside of her body. Her trust in God made her understand whatever God asked of her was the very best for her life. How many mothers do trust God. Mary could have not been the Lord's earthly mother if she would have not been faithful to the Lord. There have been many a time where I have heard my own mom crying and pleading God with my name being mentioned in every other sentence. And there's a good reason for that because I wasn't always the loveliest of young men. I had a rebellious streak and a nasty character about me. A little bit of that came out every once in a while. My dad's firm hand Fortunately, was there to keep a lot of that in check, but I suffered in, in, from a, a terrible temper. And I had this temper, and my mom would constantly pray and ask God to, to help me and to give me his peace. Friends, I think moms especially, your kids need to hear you praying for them. They need to hear you crying out to God in their behalf. I think crying out to God's a lost art anymore. Uh, we don't really know how to ask God to, to fill us with his spirit and plead for revival. And these are the kind of things that I think that our kids need to hear us be saying in a generation that's so far removed from God. How many moms trust God? Her example, Mary's example, should speak to every mom with the message of faith and faithfulness. The truth is clear from the words of her cousin. 
And blessed is she that believed, for there is, shall be a performance of those things which were told from the Lord. In other words, you're blessed because whatever God says is going to happen is going to happen, and we're going to trust him for that. Mary's reply fulfills and reveals God's heart, that, he wanted, that she wanted only what God wanted and no more, and she was blessed to be his servant. i got to say today that all moms are blessed to be servants and called to be stewards of the young people and the older people that are put in your life. Maybe you're a mom today and you say, my kids are grown and they're far from God. i got to tell you today, your influence in their life is still there. You still have an opportunity for them to know Christ. I'm reminded of Ron's testimony just a couple weeks ago where his father, who's 89 years old, came to know Jesus as Savior. i got to tell you, it's never too late. Keep praying for them. Let them hear you pray for them. Don't be afraid to let them hear you pray for them. And keep telling them about Jesus and his great love for them in their life. They'll come to know him. It's God's plan. It's his idea. Trust God, and he will do this great thing. So I just want to stand and and pray for our moms one final time. Worship team, would you come? And they're just going to play this song as we pray. But um, come on up here, and and everybody stand with me, would you? And um, let's have a gathering of moms. I know we're going to have a couple up here on the worship team, but uh, can we have an army of moms? I want to ask all the moms, or if you're a woman who's an influence, and uh, you've been someone who has uh, been a part of another young person's life that, that you've influenced or been a mentor to, I want to invite you to, uh, to all come up. In fact, let's just make it all women. How about that? I got an idea that if you're not a mom now, God's going to put somebody in your life to make yep. you a mom somehow. All ladies, come on up. Come on, press in closer. Come on, press in.